Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to be here again this evening. We are continuing our study tonight uh, through these ideas that we've been looking at. I'm pulling them from this book called Tactics, but ultimately, as we've discussed, all these are very, very biblical concepts, talking about how to present the gospel to people. Uh, and when I say present, I'm not in terms of like being up in front of a group, but just how to have conversations with people in an effective way. We've talked about a lot of things so far and kind of in, in uh, con conceptual ways, I guess, maybe we could say, not that it hasn't been practical, but we've talked about a lot of the underlying concepts for what we're going to talk about as we uh, get into some of the details. And tonight is really the last time we're going to look uh, kind of in the big picture before we really start hammering down on some of the specific tactics that the author has to talk about. So uh, next week, I'll go ahead and, and slightly preview. You've read the book already, a couple chapters, uh, then you probably already have encountered this, but if not, uh, he calls the tactics that we're going to start looking at starting next week, Columbo. And there's a reason for that if you've ever watched the show. But nonetheless, uh, we're going to talk about a couple more big picture concepts tonight uh, before we move into some even more detailed things. If you remember last week, we told this story. Uh, this is a conversation that happened between the author and an individual, I believe it was in Wisconsin, uh, who's going through a checkout line. She had this pentagram necklace. And he noticed it, and he said, well, this is a way to start a conversation, right? So he just asked her, he said, you know, is this a, a religious type, uh, is there a relig religious significance? Man, I can't talk this tonight. Uh, is there a religious significance to this necklace that you're wearing, or is it just jewelry? And she responded, she said, yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a pagan. Uh, in other words, what she was saying is she was a Wiccan. And so they had this conversation. I won't go through it all since we went through it last week, but uh, it kind of gave us an example of the types of things we're doing where essentially we just ask questions. We let the other person answer for themselves, back up their statements, and guide them through our questions in the way that we're trying to help them see some truths. Uh, but it's a very effective way of going about it to where we're not uh, in any way putting ourselves in a position to offend Obviously, if the truth offends, we can't help that, but we ourselves are trying not to let ourselves be offensive, and we're just letting them answer questions and uh, make sure we're uh, getting the right perspective, we're not putting words in their mouth, those kind of things, so that we can be effective. So we talked about that last week. Tonight, we're going to talk about another concept, and in a sense, this is kind of the other side of the coin, in a way, as we're talking about these ideas. Uh, if you uh, have read part of the chapter, you're realizing very quickly that I am not quoting the uh, names of the chapters and the names of the lessons. What I'm trying to do is pull concepts from each chapter that are going to be helpful to us. So uh, the chapter this is actually pulled from is the chapter called Reservations. Basically, he is addressing some things that we might find difficult in what we're talking about before he goes into the details of the Columbo tactic we'll talk about next week. And one of those really is focused heavily in that chapter on this idea of arguments and how arguments work and learning how to argue and learning what an argument is and all those kind of things. So I'll give you a hint. The picture on the board is not what an argument should look like, but it probably is what we associate with the concept of arguing. Let's look at a couple passages as we begin. 2 Timothy 2, 14. Charge them before God, this is Paul talking to Timothy, Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Now, if you look in the context of this, the them that he is saying to charge, uh, this is the church, and I believe specifically uh, this is kind of directed toward the leaders as well as the whole congregation. But the point is, you don't need to be engaging in all of these pointless disputes, these pointless quarrels about things that aren't accomplishing anything, that do no good, as he states it here. In fact, he says, not only does it do no good, it does harm. So when we think about that concept, automatically, and of course other passages should come to mind, for example, uh, Titus 3 and 10, don't have anything to do with a divisive brother, you know, address that, rebuke them, those kind of things. We should not be those who are causing division, especially within the church. But then we have another passage. We've talked about this one before, even in this class. Always be prepared, or always being, he's kind of describing it as a state of being, always being prepared to make an offense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And of course he goes on to say, with meekness and fear, which is very important, as we'll talk about in a moment. But those two things, in a sense, don't really seem to work together, do they? Even last week we talked about, 
If I say that I'm going to defend or make a defense, what does that kind of imply? Well, it tends to imply some kind of conflict, right? It tends to imply some kind of uh, combat, even, maybe, uh, when we think about this idea of defense. And yet, we're not supposed to have quarrels over things that don't matter. We're not supposed to be divisive. We're not supposed to do all these things. So let's just ask a question, then, as we begin. Thinking about this word arguing, because I'm going to use that, and in fact, uh, in some uh, translations, you know, this idea of always being ready to give an answer or give a reason, or really, we might even accurately say in terms of how it's worded, make an argument for uh, the reason, the hope that is in us. Let's just ask this question. What is an argument? What's the first thing, maybe I should say, that comes to mind when you hear the word argument? Okay, good. Anytime we're talking about an argument, it is implied there are two different, or more maybe, but at least two different opinions that are in conflict with one another. Good. What else comes to mind when you hear the word argument? Disagreement. Okay, disagreement. So again, there's, there's not, we're not on the same page about something. What else? What, what picture do you see in your mind? <laughs> maybe besides the picture that I already have the screen, right? Someone gets mad. Someone gets mad, right? Now, we talked about it last week. That's a problem because if they get mad, then I've lost. If I get mad, then I've lost. What else? Somebody said something else. I thought I heard another comment. Do what? Ah. Okay, okay. In debates, depending on the debate, right? In debates, there are arguments presented. Now, if we talk about political debates, usually they are more like zingers than actual arguments, but nonetheless, uh, that is the design, at least, of what debate's supposed to be. And if you look back, maybe uh, in, uh, I don't know what time period we really have to go back to to get to what a debate should have been, but uh, whether we're talking politics or religion or anything else, but typically speaking, what debates look like now aren't really how they were originally designed to be. A debate was originally designed, I present the best evidence I have for my position, the other person then presents the best evidence they have for their position, and then we try and piece together or dismantle, depending on the situation, uh, dismantle the other person's argument, piece together my argument, show why the evidence best supports my point of view. Unfortunately, that's almost never how we use the term argument today. Maybe in a courtroom, I don't know, Keith, you might be able to help us out with that. Maybe in a courtroom that's still used beyond just a fight. <laughs> but anytime I hear the word argument as it's used generally today, I think of like, okay, this is going to be ironic because I know I'm not old enough for the actual uh, original airing of this, but we did used to watch the Dick Van Dyke show growing up, believe it or not. There's an episode called The Night the Roof Fell In where uh, Rob and Lori, Laura, Lori, uh, they uh, they get into this this fight, right? And then it's portrayed where uh, they're retelling the fight, and you know, of course, in their retelling, it's just they're the angel, and the other person is just being horrible. But the point of it is, when you actually watch what actually happened, it's a fight. It's not an argument in the classical sense where we're just calmly presenting our points of view. This is how dare you know? It's it's very much there's emotions involved. No one's really actually listening. It's just it's a fight. That's how we usually use the word argument to refer to, that kind of exchange. But that's not really what an argument means. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting we need to try and take back the word argument or something like that in terms of how we use it with other people. We can't change the way that words change meaning sometimes. But we should understand for the context of what we're talking about for our purposes, we should understand what an argument is, even if we never use that wording with other people, because it would probably be misunderstood. When it comes right down to it, an argument is simply laying out the reasons why I believe a certain position is true. Now, it's not the belief that the position is true. I can say I believe the walls are made of wood, right? That's not an argument. That's just a statement of the position. The argument would be, I'm looking at it, and I see a pattern, 
that seems to conform to wood. I've touched it before, and I've seen that it conforms to wood. I've seen other things that are of this material before, and they, I know, were made of wood. And so then I'm kind of laying out an argument. I'm laying out the evidence, the reasons why. Now, of course, that's a very, very basic level, right? No one's going to argue with me, pardon the pun, that that's made of wood. But the point is that an argument, when it comes right down to it, is simply me using reason, which God gave me, right? It's using reason to try and lay out the, the, the evidence for why something is or isn't true. Now, that's not, again, how we use that terminology. But... For our purposes, for just a moment, I want us to think about what we're trying to accomplish when we have a discussion with someone. Ultimately, if my goal is to help someone else see that something is true, God's words, the resurrection, you know, things like that, right, the gospel, or something is not true, false teaching, other religion, and so forth, if that's my goal, I'm trying to help them see that all these other things aren't true and that God's word and the message of the gospel is true. Well, if I'm going to prove it, if I'm going to convince them, I've got to have an argument. I've got to have my reasoning laid out in some way. But, and that's where the tricky thing is, it's not just about having the argument. It's about how to communicate it. Let's think about Ephesians chapter 4. So we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every, every wind of doctrine. Now, in the church, this should be a strength. It isn't always, unfortunately. But if I believe something as a Christian, why should I believe that something? Okay. If I believe something as a Christian, it shouldn't be because I believe it. <laughs> I believe it because I believe it. Well, that's not saying anything, right? It shouldn't be because that's what my parents taught me, although that's good and helpful as far as it goes. It shouldn't be because my preacher said it. Oh, please never do that. I will be very, very quick to say, yeah, I'm not going to stand by that because that's, that's not a reason, right? Okay. It should be because... That's what God has said, and I can show you that that's what God has said, and I can show you that that's the correct interpretation of what God has said. In other words, as the church, before we even talk about sharing the gospel with others, just for our own sake, I should know why I believe what I believe. I shouldn't just believe it, because if, if I don't know why I believe it, you know what's going to happen? Every time I hear something different, I'm going to have no reason to think that what I believe is any more true than that, unless I just go with, well, that's what I've always been taught. And then what are people going to think? Well, you don't actually have a reason for believing, right? We're called to have arguments for what we believe, is the point. Not arguments in the sense of getting into a fight over it. I should be able to say, this is why, from Scripture, from reason, using reason in Scripture, really, this is why I believe what I believe. Otherwise, ultimately, <laughs> why do I believe it? And notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. Not only should I have an argument for what I believe, he says, we destroy, he's talking about Christians, we destroy arguments. And every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. What does it mean to destroy an argument? No, it doesn't mean having good singers in a political debate, <laughs> by the way. What does it mean legitimately to destroy an argument? Give proof. Give proof of what? That your side is right. Not even that your side is right. There's a nuance here, but... If I destroy an argument, I'm not trying to prove my side is right. I'm just trying to show that the argument for the other side is insufficient. That the evidence that is being presented to support the other position isn't actually valid. Now, we can go into the terminology. There's both soundness and validity and, and argumentation and syllogisms, all that. That's, that's not where we're going right now. Uh, be thankful. We had to read, oh man, we had to read this book. The content is great. 
but it was written in the 1800s when we were in logic class at, uh, at preaching school. We had to read this book, and I'm saying like preaching school when I was a teenager. Oh man, it was it was just the wording is so hard because it's in the 1800s, right? It's so hard to follow. The point though is that this idea that we're talking about of destroying arguments as well as having our own, this is fundamental to Christianity. I have to know why I believe what I believe, and I have to know why I believe what I believe to the extent that I can show why the evidence being given for something else doesn't match up, doesn't, doesn't track. If I'm unwilling to make an argument for the truth, and I'm not saying make an argument even in the sense of talking to someone else, I'm just talking about if I'm unwilling to make an argument to sit down and say, this is why I believe what I believe, why do I believe it? Because just saying, oh, I think this is true, that, that, that's just a statement. That's not anything. There has to be a, well, let's look at the scripture. Here's the scripture. Now let me interpret it correctly so that we can then gain an accurate principle, and then let's apply that principle to the specific situation we're talking about. There has to be that evidence, or else why do I believe what I believe. But, as we said, then there has to be the other side of this. I have to be willing to lay out the argument, but that's for me. I also have to be willing to present that argument, but let's just ask this question. Is it enough simply to share an argument for what I believe? Is it enough to simply make sure that the person has the evidence. In other words, let's just take an example. I don't know uh, if there's anyone of this description, but let's just say I, I, I encounter an atheist somewhere. And I, I don't know if there are many atheists that live around here. I know in the South usually it's kind of rare, but uh, wherever we're at, let's just say I encounter an atheist. If I walk up to him, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week too. If I walk up to him, and I say, hi, my name is Neil. Let me tell you why I believe in God. And then I just start listing off all the reasons I believe in God. And I make it a, a, an argument, right? I don't just like, they're not random. They're all strung together. This is why this makes sense. This is why this makes sense. This is why this makes sense. Is that a good idea? <laughs> is that going to be effective? Have I shared my argument? Yes? So what's missing? How I present my argument matters just as much as the argument itself. But there's got to be an argument there. That's the thing that we've got to make sure we're not missing as we go through here. That's why I wanted to talk about this tonight. Could I ask questions till I'm blue in the face and not have an argument that I'm trying to get to, not have a logical, reasoned out position that I'm trying to get to. Yeah, I can ask questions all day long whether I have an argument or not. So you see where the problem is? We can use the tactics that are in this book and ask questions in our interactions with people and not have an argument. Or, we can have an argument, but not ask the questions, not use a intelligent way of going about the conversation, and guess what happens either way? I don't accomplish what I need to accomplish. If I make the argument without presenting it well, they're not gonna listen to it. And if I don't have an argument, but I ask all the questions, well, they might think I'm really smart, but I haven't actually shared anything with them. We've got to have both there as we are doing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out there to y'all, and this is not, well, it is something I've experienced personally, but the example that I can use is not something I've experienced personally. There was a, uh, a teacher at one of the schools that I have been at uh, in my history. I'm not going to elaborate. I don't think he's teaching anyway anymore. Uh, but uh, there was a, a, a professor at one of the schools that I went to. Uh, there's, I don't have anything personally wrong with this uh, or, or, I, say. I don't have anything against this professor, personally. But 
there were some things I heard that I found interesting in his classes from other people that were in there. He was very good at playing devil's advocate, meaning if someone presented an idea, a position, he was really, really good at trying to kind of tear down the position, right? He was very good at asking stumper questions, very good at trying to, you know, kind of take him aback, kind of catch him off guard, give him something they hadn't thought about before, and all those kind of things in this class. Whatever the position was that they put forward, whether it was a good position, whether it was a false position, you know, what, whatever the case might be, he was really good at that. And once he would do this, he would, you know, eventually kind of explain, okay, you see what just happened here, here's the, the weaknesses of the argument, here's the actual truth of the matter, you know, all these things, but here's kind, of, here's kind of the issues and so forth. The problem was, and again, I wasn't personally in his class for this, but this is from students that went through it, and I know this happens a lot because I have had experiences like this in different settings in my own, uh, in my own life. Eventually, he got to where he didn't do that second part. He would play devil's advocate. He would start trying to tear down arguments and make them question themselves and all these kind of things, but he never actually followed it up with guiding them to the right answer or explaining where the weaknesses were or explaining to them, here's where we need to get to. So all he did was just leave them with a bunch of questions. Well, that doesn't help anybody. There's got to be an argument there that we help people get to. For my own part, and something that I have experienced, I did go through one class, hasn't been too, too long ago, and this wasn't a brown trail, by the way, I'll just say that, but it was at a different uh, institution. And I went through this class, and there were, a lot of, there were a lot of questions that were thrown out about a particular book of the Bible that were very good food for thought. There were important questions that needed to be discussed. There were important questions for us to ponder and to think about. And they were never, ever answered in any way. And I don't just mean answered like, I'm going to spoon feed you the answer. I, I am very much a proponent of guiding people to get to the conclusions for themselves. There wasn't any of that, though. It was just, let's throw a bunch of questions about there. Let's basically get us to question everything we think we know about this book of the Bible, and then we're going to leave it there. We never are going to ask questions that get us to a proper understanding of the book. We're never going to ask questions that resolve some of these things or help us dig enough to where we can resolve these things. We're just going to leave everything in limbo. That doesn't help anyone. So that's the side that we're talking about tonight, then. I have to have an argument that I'm getting at. I have to have, in a sense, the end in mind, not in terms, as we talked about, of harvest, necessarily, but I have to know where I'm trying to get the person to as we're talking, while at the same time trying to use questions like Jesus did so that I am guiding them but I'm guiding them not just aimlessly. I'm not trying to just get them to question things. I'm trying to get them to question things so that they get to a particular point, so that they understand a particular conclusion. That's key. Now, here's the problem, and he talks about this a little bit in the book as well. I can't force anyone to listen to what I'm trying to get them to understand. Now, I understand we're mainly asking questions here. I can't force anyone to answer the question. I can't force anyone to accept the conclusions that these questions naturally are going to bring. For example, what did Jesus do whenever he was asked, by what authority do you do these things? Who gave you this authority? What did he do? Anybody remember? He asked, yeah, the question. He asked a question. What question did he ask them? That was one of the things he does, but that's not in this particular instance, but you're on the right track. He, they asked what authority he did these things. Yeah, you know, they asked. He asked what? It was about John, right? By what authority did John do his ministry? So he says, if you'll answer by what authority John did this, I'll answer by what authority I'm doing it. Simple enough, right? What did they do? They knew exactly what the answer to the question was. They just didn't want to answer it, right? They didn't answer his question. There are going to be times, if we use what we're learning here correctly, 
there are going to be times where we ask someone a question we know the answer to, and they know the answer to. And they're going to stop it right there and move on. We can't force them to keep going to the point where they get to the truth. But, and here's the key of all of this, we can do our best to remove every obstacle possible. That's why we try and ask questions whenever we can instead of making statements. Because we're removing some obstacles that might otherwise be there. That's why we try and have in our minds our argument laid out so that as we're asking those questions, we're leading them through our argument, oftentimes without them really even realizing it, not in a manipulative way, as we talked about last time, at least not in a bad manipulative way, as we talked about, all teaching is technically manipulation in a way, but what we're talking about is the idea of removing obstacles. I'm trying to get rid of anything that's going to make it harder for them to understand the truth, whether that be aspects of my personality, which is part of why, right? We ask questions, because uh, you can ask this. Sometimes I, in no way, am intending to be, uh, what should I say, uh, overly direct or uh, uh, offensive or anything like that, and it just, I don't realize I do it, but I'll say something, and this is like, you know, that kind of came off as a little bit too direct, or that kind of came off as a little bit offensive. I've, I've uh, told some of y'all, and Liz loves to tell this story, but the other day we were over there at the fellowship, right? And I had said something trying to communicate, you know, that I don't have much life experience, and y'all have a lot more than I do. And instead I said, I'm not old, right? I didn't think a thing of it, but I just called everybody in the auditory old, right? <laughs> the point is, we're trying, as unintentional as it may be, we're trying to remove every obstacle that we can through the process, both any obstacle of, well, you don't have any reason for backing it up, which is why we need an argument, or any obstacle of, well, you're putting words in my mouth, which is why we ask questions, and of course, that's, there's a lot of other reasons why we do both these things, but that's why we're being tactical, in the name of the book, right? That's why we're being intentional about not only what we're saying, but how we're saying it, because we're trying to move every obstacle we can. I can't force people to listen. And we talked about this concept a little bit already. I can't force people to listen to me. I can't necessarily get them to the point of harvest, right? I can't necessarily get them to the point where I close the deal, they say, I want to become a Christian, obey the gospel, all that kind of thing. I can't do all that. I can't guarantee I'm going to get to any of those points, right? Any of those milestones with them. You know what I can always do? I can always put a rock in someone's shoe. You ever walked on gravel for a while and get a rock in your shoe? And you can't stop thinking about it until you get it out? That's the goal, ultimately, with this kind of system. I'm trying to give them something they can't get out of their minds. I'm trying to put something... They may not listen. They may not answer my question. They may leave in a huff. Now, that's, again, an obstacle I'm trying to avoid because if they get mad, I lose. But... I can't force them to do anything. I can put a rock in their shoe. I can give them something they've never thought of before that either makes it a lot harder for them to believe something they've been believing or makes it a lot harder for them to ignore something they haven't been believing. I can always do that. Just like I can always be a gardener, that's ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about being a gardener. Getting them from step one to step two, right? Getting them a little further, a little closer, helping them put one more piece of the puzzle in place. I can do that. And that's where my focus needs to be. I focus on where I am. I can put a rock in their shoe. I've got my argument. I'm not going to lay the whole thing out all at once. I'm asking my questions. I'm not going to ask every question at once. I'm giving them just something that they can't stop thinking about is the goal. So that I get them a little further along to where they need to be. So, talking about argument as we close up. God wants me to tactfully expose others to arguments for truth. The tactfully part, that's why we're doing it the way we're doing it. We're asking questions. We're guiding them in this process, just like Jesus did. We're using him as our example in the approach that we're trying to use to teach. 
But even through questions, we're still, whether they realize or not, we're exposing people to arguments. Not arguments in terms of fighting. We're exposing them to a pattern of evidence, if you will, that is laid out to help them see the truth. That's my job. That's your job. Our job is to expose someone to an argument for the truth. And God's in control of the rest. I can't force people to do anything. And it's probably a good thing that I can't force people to do anything, right? It's not our job. Our job is to show people, here's the truth. Let me help you understand some reasons why you believe that. And I'm doing that usually through questions. And God's going to do the rest. Next week, we're going to start looking at the Colombo tactics. It involves three questions. These three questions can be easily memorized, and they can be easily adapted to any situation. But we're going to start looking at this idea because it's so, so important for us to understand how we can make a difference in any kind of conversation that we have. If there's anything we can do to encourage you, to uh, pray for you this evening, we invite you to let us know. We'd love to do that as we stay in the scene together. I must <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat>